Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Vladan Jevremovic. Uh, the title of my talk is How Small Modeling Errors May Lead to Big Errors in Heat Maps. Uh, before I begin, um, let me say a few words about uh, my company, IB Wave Solutions. This is our third talk, and uh, by now, most of you should know that we are RF design and planning, in building RF design and planning software OEM. We've been in in-building business since 2003, and about, I would say, 18 months ago, we launched our IBWave uh, PC Wi-Fi product, which is on the Wi-Fi side of in-building. Before then, we were on the cellular side. So we are quite experienced, but not quite experienced uh, in Wi-Fi as we are in cellular. And uh, how many of you have you attended our workshop last night? Okay, quite a few. So um, you heard this yesterday. I'm just continuing on where we stopped. So anyway, um, this is going to be embarrassing if my Skype keeps popping up. So, um, hmm. all right, so what should I do? I guess ignore this. Okay, anyway. Uh, so, um, so what's new since, uh, since uh, we last saw each other, which was in Phoenix? Uh, IBWave had released nine of our software, um, IBWave Wi-Fi PC, and I got published. Um, there is a book on indoor wireless communications that was written by Professor uh, Aragon Zavala, and the professor asked me about, what, three years ago to do a chapter on case studies, on inbuilt case studies. And I turned in my manuscript about two years ago. So there are five case studies in a chapter in this book written by me. Unfortunately for you, those are all cellular case studies um, because that was about the time that I turned in the uh, manuscript that we just started looking into Wi-Fi. But as they say, there is always a second edition to the book. So. Um, we are planning on actually including uh, Wi-Fi case studies for the second edition. So if you guys uh, want to take a look at the book, uh, please do so after my talk. Uh, there is a bit of a Wi-Fi and uh, penetration loss material discussion in, uh, in other chapters. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, start with this uh, presentation. And uh, the agenda that we have is as follows. Uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about uh, modeling. As, we, as I said, we are RF design and planning software OEM, so we do know modeling quite, a, uh, quite well. Um, a lot of those things you have, if you have passed the design professional class, you have seen it. Uh, floor scaling er errors, missing wall and improper wall material errors. Um, what is new is we're going to talk about inclined surfaces. Um, and antenna patterns, how uh, having interpolated versus real world measured 3D antenna pattern will um, impact your design. And then I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about fading margin, because I have not seen this, this topic covered very frequently uh, when, when we talk about in-building design. And in the end, as a bonus, I will touch upon RF survey and uh, how choice of survey routes may impact your um, output, your interpolated RF survey data, which is going to be quite significant, as we will see. And throughout my presentation, I'm going to be jumping between my PowerPoint slide and my um, prepared um, files, simulation files, to illustrate my, my point that I'm trying to make. So first we start talking about modeling, and uh, this is um, floor scaling. Um, this is something that is, that is mentioned a few times throughout your design professional class. Never scale your floor plan using doors. It is very tempting to do so because they are everywhere, and we all know that doors are about three feet wide. Um, but don't do that, because if you just make a 10% error in positioning your scaling in the door, this will uh, cause 23% error, error in the whole area in this one example. So um, instead of one, uh, 0 0.9 meters, I 
on purpose put one meter on a scale, which basically increased the area from 1,283 square meters to 1,580 square meters. If you are used to square feet, just multiply this by 11 and you will get um, the uh, square footage in, uh, in, in, uh, in feet. So that is quite significant increase in size. And uh, how does that translate to coverage? So if you look at the signal at next 70 dBm, which is something that you guys have seen before, um, there are certain um, percentage coverage associated with NEG 70 dBm for this example where I scaled properly. And that is about 76%, right? So you have about 76% of this area have a signal of NEG 75 or dBm or better. When you improperly scale this only by 10% in the size of the um, of the doorway, your signal is going to drop, the percentage of the coverage is going to drop to 70%. So it dropped 6% for this one floor. All right, fine, the problem, so you may say it's not all that much, that is true, but then on every floor you have this problem, right? So it kind of propagates, once you do it incorrectly and if you have floor plans that are identical, like most hotels do, then you're gonna, you're gonna be stuck with that problem through in every single floor. So, and then when I was showing this to somebody, he said, okay, fine, but what is the solution to this problem? Oh, it is uh, basically get something like this, which is what I got from Keith last time when I was in Phoenix because I was, I was in the room and he called my name and I got this. So, so yeah, get this, it is inexpensive, or this, it is also inexpensive, or this which is also not that expensive. So why would you need a GPS reader? Well, you can go outside the building and read your GPS coordinates in every, in every corner. And that's going, going to do just a good job as this, this, or this. So essentially, um, be more precise. And when you are doing the uh, distance measure, actually it helps if you go from side to side of the whole floor plan. Okay. The smaller the, um, the, the, the tracking area that you are trying to figure out the, 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 the size of, um, the uh, larger the relative error is going to be. And I took the, uh, side, the, uh, the doorway um, for a reason, because 10% if you, uh, on, let's say, 0 0.9 meters is a lot. It is, you know, I mean, it is ten, just 10 centimeters, but as a relative error is, is big, right? So that's why um, going for a small size as a reference is a bad idea. All right, so the ne next case is a curious case of a missing wall, okay? So um, always check blueprints for missing walls before the survey, which means you show up on a site, uh, take a look and see if all the walls that should be there are there. Or if you don't have a wall on a floor plan and there is one over, um, you know, in there, then it means that your blueprints are out of order, that they're not um, up to date. So this, is, this, this did happen. We did take the measurement data and this is what we got, okay? So you have a hot signal right here and then not so hot right next to it. And there is no wall, okay? So obviously um, your signal is not going to drop this much um, if you are just a few feet away. And there was obviously a reason why they turned around and did this, okay? So obviously this was, there was a wall in there, but they, they did not notice that on the floor plan there was no such thing. So they did not um, bother to, to put it where it should be, okay? So always examine your survey data and see if there are unexpected drops anywhere um, because uh, your signal will tell you if the wall is missing. If, just in case that you have um, not noticed that when um, you were doing the survey. Um, so, and then uh, we've seen yesterday how um, when you are importing a CAD file, you should assign the wall type um, with, each, um, uh, with each layer. 
and then so the question is, how am I going to choose the proper um, type of the wall? Well, you know, you should have some experience as to where you have a drywall and where light sheet rock, et cetera, et cetera. But it does get confusing, OK, for the novice um, user. And then here I'm giving you an example as to what happens if you import a wall as a drywall versus a light sheetrock. Um, so the signal at next 70 dBm, we have seen this in a previous example, was at 76%. And that was with drywall in a hotel. So what would happen if I said, OK, it's not drywall, it's sheetrock? Well, you see how much hotter my my simulation is here. I had about 97% of the coverage uh, for the same amount of APs if I identified those uh, walls in between, um, in between rooms as uh, light sheetrock as opposed to drywall. Okay, so quite significant difference if you are importing a, a wrong type of the, of the wall. Then the next is uh, inclined surface. And uh, this is where I'm going to uh, step out of the presentation to show you how it looks uh, uh, in our tool. But this is uh, essentially escalator in a subway station. So um, here is, pro you would really need to model this as inclined surface. Okay. Or, as the case may be, uh, not just one um, long surface, but uh, you know, um, uh, a few uh, sort of inclined surfaces with the horizontal step uh, area. Um, and if you do that, uh, that way the signal is bad. As you can see, you have a low, low signal um, because this AP is not really propagate, does not propagate all that well along the inclined surface. But if you leave that as a horizontal surface, then you're going to have a really hot signal. And that's about 20 dB difference if uh, you don't bother to do it properly. So I'm going to show you how that looks like in here. So this is um, what you have as a modeling as a flat surface of that area. which is the one right here. As you see, the signal there is quite hot. But I model that as a, as a flat surface area. The proper modeling would be this one. which, as you can see from the sideways, we have inclined surface and then stepping area and inclined surface and step area, inclined surface, and so on. So this, as you can see from the signal, is not doing all that well, which is logical because your AP is right here, and then it will um, not propagate upwards because of the, uh, of the difference um, of the, in, in the elevation. So <clears throat> going back to our presentation, um, the next is uh, <clears throat> antenna pattern. So in release 9, we first um, launched what we call measured 3D pattern. Basically, antenna manufacturer would approach us and say, we have a 3D um, pattern measured. So we want you to display that in your database instead of doing the interpolated 3D from uh, 2D cuts, which is you know, the most common way to present the, um, um, the, the antenna radiation pattern. And I'm going to, uh, and you have seen that yesterday, how those uh, um, interpolated cuts look like. I'm going to show you in a, in a few moments how the real deal looks like. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is the first example is um, 
uh, when we have a directional antenna that is pointed down tilt over horizontal surface. And this is how it looks like interpolated from 2D cuts. And this is how it looks like on a measured uh, 3D. So obviously, there is a difference right around here. Not so much out front, but on the side lobes. Okay. So how does it look like in our tool? So this is the interpolation. So as you see, interpolated doesn't really have all that much of the side lobes, as you see. Okay. It's a nice directional pattern, but on the, on the side lobes, you see it's like kind of like only thing that we have are those two cuts and nothing in between, right? So it's a nice theoretical way of looking into it. But this is what happens when the manufacturer supplied us with the uh, measured 3D data. You see how side lobes are much stronger. And they are everywhere. There is absolutely no symmetry in this on the back lobe, as you see. There is some symmetry um, on the side lobes. And the signal is much, much stronger around here. So when we go back to the presentation, I'm going to show you what the difference is between these two. As we have noticed, the sig this is the difference between um, the uh, interpolated uh, pattern and the measured pattern. And when it is dark, that means that the measured pattern is stronger than interpolated. So in this area, we have, that's around about this one, meaning that you will, we will have 15 to 10 dB stronger radiation on the back lobe um, with the measured pattern, with the real deal, okay? So um, the ap approximated model is not doing all that well in this, in this area, right? With the side lobe and in the back lobe. Out front situation is kind of okay. We see, um, I, I can tell you that I looked into what the actual value is. It gives you the um, zero to five dB um, range. And it is really only about half a dB and one dB, maybe 1.2. It doesn't really go all the way up to, to five, right? So yeah, it is not looking good, but it is mostly in here. But then again, the question is, okay, what happens if I have inclined surface, right? You have seen a flat surface and it didn't look all that good, but it, it was kind of okay. So now, what happens if I have 30 degree inclined surface slope? with 10 degree antenna down tilt. So you're asking, okay, 30 degrees, isn't it like steep? Well, yes, and the question is then, so why would you put 30 degree there? It's because that's what we, we see in stadiums. Those upper le uh, level decks with the chip tickets, they're about 25, 26, 27 degree. So 30 degree is a little bit exaggerated, but not by much. So this is what my <clears throat> interpolated um, radiation pattern from 2D cuts look like, and this is what the measured um, data looks like. So you see that radiation pattern is not looking very nice. And I'm expecting that I'm gonna see quite a bit of a difference between those two patterns when I am facing inclined surface slope. And uh, the answer is yes, I am. As you see now, this is the difference between the two, as I said, where you see blue. That means that uh, the uh, measured uh, pattern is stronger than the uh, interpolated. And that's pretty much almost everywhere, and especially in this area, it is really a concern. So as you see, if you are designing a stadium, you really should get your 3D um, data, measured 3D data, should not rely on uh, approximation of, from 2D cuts because it is going to look quite different as you can see from those two heat maps. And um, if that, this is not enough, then the difference 
is going to uh, convince you because everything that we have that is kind of like steely blue and dark blue is significant difference, 5 dB or more. Um, only in this area, the difference is not all that much. And that area is only the green area right here. So, um, moving on. Um, Just a quick yes. question. Do you have those measured antenna models from all the manufacturers' antennas that you have in your system? From, from most. From most. We released nine. We released quite a lot of, of, of antenna patterns that, are, uh, that, that came from manufacturers. So not their predicted, but their actual measured? Yes. They're actually 3D measured antenna patterns, yes. Have you compared those 3D antenna measured patterns from the manufacturer from actual real world deployments as well? No. They just gave us those based on their measurements and we have not uh, compared it to the real world, no. no. So anyway, um, I uh, promised that uh, to tell, I told you that um, the uh, stadium is uh, an example um, of, of um, inclined surface. And this is how it looks like with antennas on above them with the inclined surface. Okay. Right. So um, that you are seeing now all the layers when I remove the prediction. You will see the antennas that are above the uh, inclined uh, surfaces. And you see that the inclined surface for those upper deck uh, le uh, levels is, is quite steep. So. So let's move along. The uh, next topic that I wanted to cover was is fading. Okay, so now this is going to be a bit educational as to what the fading is and how to deal with this. So um, when we look at the path loss, which is this, we have three uh, path loss components. We have medium path loss, which is this straight, nice straight line that goes you know, from uh, zero to some logarithm distance. Then we have um, long-term fading, which is shadowing or slow fading, which is the one that goes like sinusoidal <coughs> signal on top of that a medium path loss. And then we have a short-term fading, which is fast fading or multipath fading, which is kind of oscillates on top of that sinusoidal little thing. So there are three components, and I'm going to talk about how they affect the uh, prediction. And first, we get acquainted with uh, fast fading, short-term uh, fading. And this is what you see as you are moving along from the distance measuring signal. See that thing that goes up and down like this. That, that's your fast fading. And this fading is caused by RF signal reflection from nearby objects. And only reflected path signals contribute to this. And it is known as multipath fading. So um, why does that exist? It exists because you have more than one, more than just direct path coming into, into your radio, right? So if I'm sitting here and not move, I'm still going to experience multipath because I'm still going to have, you know, uh, more than just direct path coming into, uh, uh, into, into my client, into, into my phone. But it gets worse as I start moving, all right? Uh, because small client movement can cause rapid signal and amplitude change. So any type of movement is going to experience worse multipath fading than if you were just stationary. Okay, so that's one thing that uh, is affecting my um, signal that is measured in this location. Second one is, and the, the fast fading, the question is, what should we do about it when we are designing for in-building networks? And 
Indoor clients with limited mobility are not affected much by fast fading. We really worry about this if we are driving down the highway, and that is really for cellular networks to worry about, not for, I mean, cellular mobile macro networks. In building networks, be that cellular or Wi Fi, should not worry much about fast fading because there is either no mobility, meaning you have your client that is not moving at all, or limited mobility. So, what is the example of, of either? Well, stadium. If you're in a stadium, you're sitting down and not really moving for the duration of the game, and so you're basically stationary. Now, if you're in a warehouse and you are going to do barcode check, you know, for uh, various items, you do have some limited mobility. So set fast fading margin to zero for the stadium networks or one um, if you are designing warehouse, right? But what you should do in any way, uh, in any case, you should remove fast fading from your RF survey data before you jump to any conclusions to what your RF survey data is, is telling you. And you do that by averaging raw data that you collected, okay? Your, um, client should be able to get, you know, um, a lot of samples per minute, and you need to average them out. Um, and you should do that before you do any further data, data analysis. This should be your first step. And the way you do the averaging, by the window size. Basically, if this is your data that you collected, then you have to choose a window size over which you're gonna do the averaging. So the black, um, dots are, is your raw data, and the red dots are the data that is averaged out. So recommended window size is five wavelengths at 2.4 gigahertz and 10 wavelengths at five gigahertz. I'm not going to, to discuss much why five and not, let's say, 25, and why 10 and not 50. Just take my word for it, those are good values. Okay. Um, so then um, we tackle slow fading. This is much more interesting um, topic for the purpose of RF planning and design. This is the variation of the signal against the median path loss. Again, if I'm sitting here, I'm still going to experience slow fading because the signal that comes you know, from outside of this room is gonna penetrate through a wall. And then that wall is an obstacle and I am in the shadow of that wall. That's why this is called shadowing as well. Um, so the variation there is because of the non-direct uh, line of sight signal. It can be diffracted signal. It doesn't have to be penetration through the wall, which means if this door is open and then I see a I'm partially obscured from the AP outside, I still will have uh, shadowing or slow fading. So what should we do about this? The prediction tools, um, when you do predictive analysis, they always will give you median path loss. So that median path loss does not have fast fading or slow fading in it. In median path loss, you saw there was a nice straight um, curve um, that goes from zero to some distance. Uh, <clears throat> so what does that mean? It means if I give you prediction with only median path loss, and if I measure, and let's say that this is uh, the area where your signal is, let's say, greater than neg 70 dBm, this, this area in here. If I'm giving you a median path loss, uh, then if you say that your um, that the median path loss prediction is given, that means that your cell edge, your let's say the coverage area of your AP is along this red, um, red circle. And why I'm saying this, it's because if I give you the prediction with the median path loss, I'm telling you that the cell edge, if you measure the signal at the cell edge, half the time the measured signal will be less than what your target signal is. So in other words, if I design without slow fading margin, and if I tell you this is your coverage for, uh, of, of, of AP for neg 70 dBm, and then if I go in and you go out and measure uh, what the signal is along the edge of that coverage, half the time your measured signal will be less than neg 70 dBm. 
and that is not a good thing. Okay. Um, what you want to do is you want to be able to measure that signal and almost all the time to see that the signal is better than NEG 70 dBm or to it. To do that, you add slow fading margin. Yes, your coverage will shrink, but your probability of measuring um, the signal greater than your target or equal to it is going to increase significantly. So you add slow fading margin and then your coverage area shrinks to the black circle. But there, at that coverage edge, 90% of the time you are going to measure a signal that is greater than your minimum required signal. So what is that slow fading margin? Well, most engineers would opt for either 75% or 90% cell edge reliability. So what is the cell edge reliability? I just told you that this is the area that is your cell edge over which you will be measuring your target signal. Your 75% reliability means that 75 out of 100 measurements will be neg 70 dBm in this example, neg 70 dBm or better. 90% reliability, 90 out of 100 measurements will be neg 70 dBm or better. So that is the cell edge reliability. Most engineers opt for either 75 or 90% cell edge reliability. Nobody wants 50% because it is just, you know, you toss uh, a coin whether you are good with your promise of neg 70 dBm or not. So anyway, uh, slow fading margin value that should be taken should be standard deviation, which is standard deviation is a variation of indoor signal around its mean value times some multiplication factor. Now, what would that standard deviation would be? You can take that from um, literature, but we did one better. We did measure standard deviation at shopping mall, at hockey arena, at and in our IBM office at 2.1 gigahertz. Now I'm going to stop and make a comment about you know what exactly happened there. Yes, we did measure at 2.1 gigahertz. Why we didn't measure at 2.4? This was done five years ago, and then uh, we recently post-processed this with Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz in mind. What does it mean? It means that I had in mind the fact that you really, that we really have much lower path loss um, uh, range at, for Wi-Fi at 2.4 than what is given for cellular. Why am I saying this? Because it's typical that you have zero dBm on the transmit power of your AP and that your signal, minimum signal, is neg 86. So if I have three uh, dBi of the antenna on top of the transmitter, I effectively have only about 89, 90 dB of the path loss to play. Whereas in a cellular, I have 110, maybe more, right? So I had to cut about 20 dB from the range of the data that was collected to post-process. And that affects standard deviation quite a bit. As you can imagine, I had, I had signal that was mostly in line of sight. There was some diffraction, some reflection, and, and stuff like that, but it was much closer to the antenna, much closer to the AP for, uh, for Wi-Fi than it what is for cellular. So that's why these values are uh, post-processed with Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz in mind. Now, the question is, why didn't I repeat these measurements at 2.4? I certainly could do that at the office. Um, because we have access to this 24-7. The problem are these two, especially the arena, okay? So we carried lots of favors to get into the arena to do the measurements at 2.5. Going back to do 2.4 was just something that, that was not really feasible. That was one of the reasons. The bigger reason was while the, uh, the equipment, measurement equipment at, for cellular at 2.1, we know what we're dealing with. It is very well calibrated and the results are repeatable. Not so much with you know, those dongles and USB 2.0 and 3.0 as Miko had said yesterday from Mikahal. 
Um, those are not just uh, reliable in the sense that you can get repeatable results. Now, with the Sidekick, I understand it is way better, so we are looking forward to actually doing some repeatable measurements at 2.4 with, with Sidekick. But that's why I'm presenting you 2.1 now. It is close enough to 2.4, and I also um, took care to process uh, the data for standard deviation accordingly for Wi-Fi needs. Having said that, these are the values that we have gotten from Office, uh, NHL Arena, and Shopping Mall. Five, six, and four. Uh, these are, I would say, two to three dB less than what you would ex uh, expect to see in, uh, for cellular. And that's because, as I said, the range was, was, was shorter, right? And then with that in mind, you can calculate cell edge reliability slow fading margin. And these are given in here, right? So you basically have to add, if you want 90% reliability, you have to add those values to your projects that are shopping mall, hockey arena, or basketball arena, and, uh, and uh, a typical office. So, so how does that really look like in heat maps? This is the heat map without the slow margin. So what do we want? We want 70 dB uh, or better. So the green area and the dark blue area, they are not good. So this is outside of the coverage, those little islands and this thing. So <clears throat> without margin, you say, all right, so these, these three guys, they did a really good job. I have about 7% of this whole area <clears throat> not, not covered, but otherwise I'm good. But if you add the margin, and how much margin are you adding? Are you adding only about 5 dB for 90% reliability? Then all of a sudden you see that holes are much, much worse. This, 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 and that, okay? So, so yeah, um, with that margin, uh, you're gonna need more APs, but you know that when you start measuring the signal, um, you're gonna be in much better shape um, as far as your promised uh, uh, signal level when you were designing the network. So that was a bit of a tutorial on the fading margin and you know how to do it and how not to do it. And then uh, my last topic is going to be RF uh, survey. So why am I talking about RF Vladimir, survey? Can I just yes. ask you a question if you wanna go back a slide? Mm -hmm. One more. Um, so the standard deviation column is in standard deviations, but yes. the cell edge is in dB? Cell edge reliability is, everything is in dB. Oh, okay. Everything is dB, nothing, so, nothing so is absolute. Could we, without doing all the math you did, mm -hmm. just add a five dB? Yes. So if the target was 70, put in 65. Um, no, uh, okay, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying, yes. You're I trying guess. to just simplify, yeah. the yeah. net result of all your hard work is yeah. Yeah. just cut, adjust. Cut, cut, cut 5 dB, yes. Okay, That's, I like simple. Uh, yes, basically what I did is I did post-processing of this to tell you that these are the values you should use for these types of uh, values. So anyway, um, RF survey, right? So why am I even talking about this? It's because nobody has enough time to do RF survey, right? You, you really are hard pressed for time and you are cutting corners and this is the price that you pay is what I'm telling you. So um, this is our office. Well, it was about six years ago or so. We are much bigger now, but just to let you know what, what you're looking for, you're looking at the cubicle area around here. You are looking at individual offices around here. And you're looking about, that was, uh, I would say, um, kitchenette, cafeteria type, and this was, I think this was like a conference room. So what you see is, um, those are just uh, the area that are corridors, and this is the cubicle area. So if you were lazy and doing the um, RF survey, you would just walk around this area, which is cubicle area, and maybe the corridors and you would not go into any individual office. So this is like a bare minimum, okay? If you are really like kind of um, concerned about accuracy, you would jump into uh, the cafeteria, you would jump into the, the main um, you know, boardroom 
and then you will like do about half of the individual offices when you do the survey. And by the way, this is the data uh, that was averaged out, so that's why you can recognize the, the points. The original data had more points, but we averaged out fa fast fading. If you recall, I said that you should do that all the time. And then if you are really, really, really good RF engineer with lots of time on your hands, then you would go in in every single office, all right? So why, and this is not realistic, but I am doing this to establish a baseline, right? So this is your gold standard, okay? So how much worse are you when you are skipping, you know, about half of the individual offices and you do not do any of them in LF service? So how much worse off are you? Okay. So what we did is, is this. We removed fast fading from RF survey using five by five uh, wavelength window. This was at 2.4. And then so what I ended up is uh, three cases when I have three different number of data points, which are listed. This is the, ba the, the gold standard, and this was half of the individual offices, and this was the bare minimum, right? And I used those to generate three interpolation prediction maps in my tool. So just think about that. So now I, I uh, made those three with a different number of points used for interpolation. Obviously, the one with the most points will be the most accurate, right? So then I did the comparison of those three interpolated maps versus measured data. But which measured data had three points? I took, obviously, the one with the most. So what that means is that you, the, the interpolated data generated with 269 points will be judged against 644 known points, okay? So obviously I used only 269 to generate the, the map and then I'm judging it against 644. I expect that map to do poorly because it was judged against more points than it was used to generate, right? So that was basically the setup. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much error am I making. So obviously the full data set was the most accurate. It had a very small mean error. Absolute mean error was less than 1 dB and standard deviation was not much either. Why? Because I judged this interpolation map against the same set of data that I used to generate it, okay? So it's just a baseline, okay? Now, this reduced data set obviously is doing a little bit worse, and the minimal data set is doing much worse. So what is fair is to say, okay, this is the baseline. How much worse am I doing against that baseline? And the answer is, if I was lazy enough not to go into any individual office, my standard deviation is about 2 dB worse, and my absolute mean error is about, about 1.6 dB worse. So what you are doing this to your RF survey data, you are making it far less reliable than with the case that you could do in every single room. But what happens if you do the reduced data, which means that you went into every other room? Well, then situation is not all that bad. Your standard deviation was worse by a little bit over a dB, and your absolute mean error is less than one dB. So if the point of this is, if you choose not to do it all, do at least half of it, okay? Because the error that you're going to be making is, I wouldn't say tolerable, but it is way better than what you would be doing if you would just go into corridors and uh, areas um, um, with, uh, with, uh, with cubicles. So anyway, that was uh, the gist of my uh, presentation. And uh, what I would like uh, to do is just to uh, give you one um, quick uh, um, uh, glance of uh, what was uh, of one exciting feature that we have in the new uh, release 9, aside from, from the interpolated uh, antennas. And that is the one that um, was also shown yesterday, um, which is basically um, we can give the uh, edge of the coverage for an antenna. This one was set at negative 5 dBm, but you can choose it to be a different value. And if you are moving it around, then, oops, this is, 
not the, yeah. If you're moving it around, you see how your coverage is going to change in, um, in real life, right? And then this is the uh, propagation that was uh, fast rate tracing based. And then you can, if you want to choose, you can go with the different types of propagation, like a variable path loss exponent, which does not really react all that well to walls because it is a very simple. Um, or a free space path loss, which is essentially just a donut type uh, shape. Uh, so anyway, this, this was, was the feature that was requested quite often from us because people did not really want to, and here you can change if you want to, you can change the target signal level. Um, you can re increase that to next 70 dBm and then it will show you what your um, coverage is for that signal. Uh, people were saying, I just want to see um, as a first approximation how it looks like, um, how the coverage looks like. I don't want to launch your engine um, to do detailed propagation analysis. I just want to see the first approximation of what my coverage would be when the walls are taken into account. And that's why we have actually put it in there and it is one of the main features in the release nine aside from the antenna interpolation, uh, antenna, um, the, the real antenna pattern uh, measurements. So this uh, pretty much ends my um, presentation and I'm, I'm open to, to questions.